Good morning, everyone. My name is Becky LeBoy. I apologize for the delay. We're having a, a few technical difficulties. Just want to check in and make sure that um, the audio is working. Okay, we are live, I hear from Joel. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Excellent. So good morning once again. Um, and again, my name is Becky LeBoy. I'm the Education Outreach Specialist with Ocean County Soil Conservation District. And many thanks to Joel Mott and Paul Leakin and the entire New Jersey Pinelands Commission for inviting me today to present my program as part of their weekly Pineland Speaker Series. As a native to New Jersey, a soil conservation educator and a native plant enthusiast, I'm very excited to present Unique Plants and Wildflowers of Barrens and Bogs. So in my daily life, I immerse myself in the environment as much as I possibly can. And I learn all I can from the science community who are the real experts. As an educator, my intention is to introduce you to some of our uh, many beautiful native plants and inspire interest and excitement so that you too will go out and explore our natural world. So before we get started, I believe that um, you may have some options on your computer as to how uh, you are viewing this, um, or maybe not since we're live through um, YouTube. So I'm going to see what happens when I do this. Okay, great. Now you should be able to see the full screen. And we're gonna start with um, a little explanation of the parts of a flower because I am going to be referring to these different parts of the flower as we explore the different wildflowers in the presentation. So on the right hand side, you can see the stamen, which are the male parts of the flower consist of the anther and the filament. And on the left hand side, the female parts of the flower are together called the pistil and they consist of the stigma, the style through which the pollen uh, travels on its way to the ovary or actually the sperm travel through the style. And uh, in the ovary is an ovule which becomes the seed and surrounding the reproductive parts are three petals you can see in the back, they're pink. Um, below the petals are two sepals, below the sepals is the receptacle, and then the peduncle is the fun word for the stem that holds up the flower. So the New Jersey Pine Barrens is a really unique environment, as I'm sure you all know. It contains a mixture of very diverse and contrasting habitats. Dry, sandy, nutrient-poor soils define much of the Pine Barrens landscape. Pockets of saturated anaerobic substrates pose different challenges to the growth and survival of plants. And anaerobic means without oxygen, so the water is taking up the space in the soil that would otherwise be occupied by air. Key colored freshwater streams and creeks follow the relief of the land, flowing down gentle slopes towards the river, the bay, and the ocean. Along the way, these water bodies create and nurture hardwood swamps and vast stands of Atlantic white cedar. These and many other habitats in the Pine Barrens support an array of uniquely beautiful native flowers, shrubs, trees, vines, and other plant types that thrive in these challenging yet magnificent conditions. So this presentation follows the structure laid out in Howard Boyd's book called The Wildflowers of the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. I will introduce you to some of my favorite plants through the calendar year, according to the month in which they offer showy interest such as bloom time, or ripe fruit or other unique botanical features. On some plants, I will linger providing interesting facts 
And on other plants, I'll simply showcase its beauty. And we'll begin with the month of March when some of our earliest plants break dormancy and working through August, the end of the summer season. One of our earliest blooming native plants is also one of our most rare, Conrad's broom crowberry, Corima conradii. It's an endangered species in New Jersey. It grows in open sandy areas as pictured here in Warren Grove. This location is just off Route 539. It offers public access to some of the Pine Barren's most rare plants, as well as its most ubiquitous plants, such as the pitch pine, creating the backdrop in this particular landscape. So Conrad's broom crowberry is a low-growing, woody subshrub, which spreads over dry sand in round, clumping patches. Stems are covered in tiny needle-like evergreen leaves. In mid to late March through early April, tiny flowers bloom at the tip of each of last year's new growth. Broom crowberry is dioecious. Male and female flowers appear on separate plants. The green clump in the back is the female plant and the red shrub in the front is the male plant. Lacking petals, the flowers are very inconspicuous to the eye. The most easily observable parts of the flowers are the purplish red male anthers, which house the pollen. A hand lens is helpful to see them clearly. The pistolate flowers or female flowers retain a somewhat more greenish yellow hue. Pollination is anamacarous, meaning wind pollinated. The stigma of female flowers receives the wind blown pollen during the pollination process. If fertilized, the female flowers will bear fruit. New vegetative growth forms in the center of the fruit cluster. Here's a female plant with fruit. This photo was taken about two weeks ago. And here is a male flower whose anthers are spent and the vegetation is turning a vibrant green color. And this male plant has a vigorous vegetative growth. This is an amazingly hardy plant of the Pine Barrens. It provides an important eco service to the soil, protecting the sugar sand from wind and water erosion. Pixie or pixie moss is another hardy perennial that lives in the sandy soil of the Pine Barrens. Tiny evergreen needle-like leaves grow thick along the trailing stems, creating a moss-like appearance. Tiny white flowers bloom in late March to early May. Once the petals drop, the pink sepals remain, offering another show of color. And here we see tiny fruits beginning to form, topped by the persisting style through which the pollen traveled to the ovary. A coating of pollen from other nearby species gives pixie moss a sparkling glow. For our next plant, we will visit a wetlands habitat. Cedar Creek meanders through Double Trouble State Park in Ocean County. The reddish brown color of the water is a product of both the iron in the soils, as well as the tannins in the surrounding cedar, pine, and oak vegetation. Tannins naturally occur in the roots, wood, bark, leaves, and fruit of many plants, particularly the oak. Tannins are a complex chemical substance derived from phenolic acids, also called tannic acid, and naturally protect the oak from bacteria and fungi. The word tannin comes from the old German word tanna, meaning oak, and it refers to the use of wood tannins derived from oak trees that were used to convert animal hides into leather. And thriving in this tea-colored water is the amazing Golden Club, Orontium aquaticum, a perennial aquatic herb in the Araceae family or Aram family. It grows in shallow water in swamps, marshes, ponds, slow-moving streams and bogs. 
It is the only living species in the genus Arontium, which contains several extinct species known only from fossils. Rooted in shallow mud, it produces interesting flowers fused together on a yellow tipped spike or spadix atop a white scape in late March through May. Pollination is entomophilous, which means pollinated by insects. The flowers are thought to be pollinated by small flies, bees, and beetles, and a small fly is visiting this flower. Bright green water resistant leaves offer contrast above the water surface. When I explore the woods looking for wildflowers, I welcome the sight of Golden Club each spring and have found it growing in several different locations as well as varied habitats, including this sluggish stream meandering through an Atlantic white cedar forest and at the edge of this large pond named Ore Pond in Double Trouble State Park also surrounded by Atlantic white cedar. Although I've never tried it myself, I've read that golden club can be grown from seed in backyard ponds and water gardens and grows best in full sun. In April, as the temperature rises, more and varied flowers begin to bloom. Leatherleaf, as its name implies, this wiry broadleaf semi-evergreen shrub has small leathery leaves. Small white bell-shaped flowers that congregate on only one side of its branch tips bloom in April and May. Once pollinated and fertilized, the ovaries begin to swell as shown here with the style persisting much like it did on the pixie moss. It grows abundantly in swamps and bogs. Not to be confused with false teeth, Eubotris racemosa, although, although the similar looking white bell-shaped flowers bloom around the same time as leather leaf. Also called swamp dog hobble and swamp sweet bells, the leaves are larger and more delicate, papery, not leathery. Surely this is a favorite of all New Jersey native plant enthusiasts. This stunning beauty, swamp pink, is endangered in the state of New Jersey. It blooms early April to mid-May, only for a short while. The bright pink flowers are actually clusters of about tiny, about 50 tiny fragrant individual flowers grouped together. Each flower is perfect, meaning both male and female reproductive parts exist in each small flower. The male pollen bearing anthers are tipped blue, contrasting with the pink petals and sepals surrounding the female stigma. Once the flowers die back, the glossy lush evergreen leaves remain vibrant throughout the growing season. Swamp pink is an obligate wetland plant and requires clean, undisturbed wetland habitat. To continue our enjoyment of this plant, it is important to protect its wetland habitat. And back to the dry pine barrens. Bearberry, Arctostaphylos uva ursi, can be found growing along the sandy pine woodland edges and blooms from mid or late April to mid-May. It is a low growing, trailing, woody subshrub with thin reddish bark and has numerous thick, shiny evergreen leaves. Plants can form large carpets that cover the dry sandy flats or cascade over sandy berms such as this roadside. Small white flower buds develop in clusters in early April. They are shaped like upside down urns or little bells characteristic of many flowering plants in the Heath family. Fertilized flowers develop into fruits throughout the summer. And by mid-August, the fruits have ripened to a bright berry, many of which persist throughout the winter. Bearberry berries are presumably relished by bears, but I have no personal experience to confirm that statement. 
This plant is quite common in the Pine Plains and it can be purchased for one's own backyard as a low maintenance ground cover for your sandy soil. Sand myrtle is one of my favorites. It blooms from mid or late April through May or June. It's just beyond peak now in our pine lands, but I encourage you to go out and enjoy it this weekend. There will most likely still hopefully be a few late blooming flowers. In late March, tiny flower buds begin to form on pink colored newly growing stems. Some plants retain last year's dried seed capsules held in juxtaposition to the new buds, adding interest to this plant's beauty. The flowers bloom in dense clusters, showcasing five snow white petals and 10 stamen tipped with pink anthers. The flowers attract tiny beetles and small butterflies. This woody shrub is short in stature, multi-branched and has tiny leathery evergreen leaves. It grows in abundance in damp sandy soils in pine oak woodlands and you will encounter it along trails in dappled shade. By May, many showy plants have broken dormancy and are on display in your local woodlands. Pink Lady Slipper. Pink Lady Slipper is a showy wildflower belonging to the orchid family. This plant grows anywhere from six to 15 inches tall and flowers generally between May and July. Its unique balloon shaped or slipper shaped flower is highly specialized. And it's really like no other existing in our local landscape. It is bright magenta in color with white and dark pink venation patterns throughout the petals, especially near the front opening of the pouch. Pink lady slipper requires bees specifically bumblebees and more specifically queen bumblebees for pollination because of their appropriate size. Specialized slipper orchids like pink lady slipper are hypothesized to be pollinated by a single pollinator species or several species in one genus. And I continue to read the scientific literature about this plant as I find it quite fascinating but pink lady slipper is a deceptive beauty. The flower's faint, sweet, fruity scent lures unsuspecting bees into the flower pouch through an opening in the front. The venation patterns direct the bee to this obscure location. Once inside, the bee finds no reward as pink lady slipper does not produce nectar. Instead, the bee finds themselves trapped unable to leave the same way they arrived. Small hairs guide them towards the top of the flower where they must push past the anthers becoming covered in pollen and must crawl over the stigma. If a bee bearing pollen visits another flower, the pollen will be deposited before picking up a fresh load on the way out. However, bees become wise to this no reward strategy and visitation is low. However, when fertilization does take place, a fruit forms and the seed set is high. Generally, orchid seeds are very tiny and do not have food supplies inside them like most other kinds of seeds. In order to germinate, pink lady slipper seeds interact with a fungus in the soil from the genus Rhizoctonia. Mycorrhizal threads of the fungus break open the seed and attach themselves to it. The fungus will pass on food and nutrients to the seed. When the lady slipper plant is older and producing its own nutrients, the fungus will then extract nutrients from the orchid roots. This mutually beneficial relationship between the orchid and the fungus is symbiosis and is typical of many orchid species. Pink lady slipper takes many years to go to go from seed to mature plants 
but can live to be 20 years old or more. Collecting pink lady slipper from the wild will undoubtedly result in failure as the plant cannot survive without this intact fungal relationship in the soil. With such a specialized lifestyle, lifestyle it's best to enjoy pink lady slipper on a walk in your local woodlands. Yet another reason to preserve and protect our natural open spaces for everyone's enjoyment. Star flower, Triantalus borealis, is a small delicate woodland plant in the primrose family. It has a whorl of five to nine lance shaped leaves that taper to points at both ends, shaped somewhat like a star. From the center of the whorl grows one or two delicate star-shaped white flowers with between five and nine pointed petals. The stamens are long and delicate with tiny golden anthers surrounding the female stigma in the center. This plant is only about four to six inches tall and can be easily overlooked on the forest floor as sometimes th there may only be a single plant. The plant has long, horizontally creeping roots that send up tiny stems. So sometimes you might come across several growing together. If you are keeping an eye out, you are likely to see this plant growing in leaf litter when you take a walk in a local pine oak woodland in May. About two weeks ago, I came across the largest population of starflower I had ever seen. Growing in the woods right along the trail's edge, there must have been over a thousand plants, and I'm telling you, it was quite a sight. This was at Ridge Road Wildlife Management Area in Bricktown in Ocean County. Pine Barrens Heather, also called Golden Heather, Hudsonia ericoides. This beauty blooms mid-May to early June. It's a multi-branching perennial subshrub with thin woody branches covered with tiny, bristly, needle-like leaves. Small, bright flowers bloom on the tips of the branches, sometimes so densely as to almost conceal the foliage. It grows in the same habitat as the Conrad's broom crowberry and prefers the same conditions, full sun and dry sandy soil. And here it is, the yellow flowers adding color to the wild landscape. Beach heather, Hudsonia tomentosa, is similar to its cousin, except the tiny bristly needle-like leaves are scale-like. The small bright yellow flowers appear on shorter, hairier, or what botanists call tomentose stalks in mid-May to early June. Beach heather is primarily a coastal dune species, so it also has salt tolerance. Turkey beard. This incredibly beautiful flower blooms mid-May to early July. A single flower cluster sits atop a tall three to five foot stalk and the cluster is made up of many tiny fragrant white flowers. The flower cluster itself can be about three inches tall and three inches round. It blooms from the bottom up so the last flowers to bloom are at the tip while the ones below it are spent and already turning brown. If you encounter these in the wild you will be practically eye to eye with these beautiful blooms. It's tricky to find these flowers when they're not blooming though, as they grow in small colonies among other shrubs and plants blending in well. They have a thick basal clump of dry wiry grass-like leaves, one foot or more in length, resembling green spaghetti. The leaves remain persistent throughout the year so if you come across some clumps of grass seemingly out of place in the leaf litter in the woods, mark the spot on your map and return again in May or June to see if turkey beard is in bloom. 
my understanding from Joel Mott of the Pinelands Commission, turkey beard is in full bloom right now. So go out and look for it. Arathusa or dragon's mouth. Blooms in the bog. It is the first of the three orchids that I seek out each year in the local bogs of the Pinelands. Although New Jersey has over 50 species of native orchids. This one blooms mid or late May to late June and the single scape or stem rises from a bulb producing a single flower. The flower is a combination of sepals and petals with the bottom petal or lip bending down with a beard of white, yellow and purple colors. Another unique and favorite plant one can't help but view in awe is the pitcher plant. This perennial grows in bogs, which are nutrient poor due to the naturally anaerobic conditions. So the pitcher plant has evolved carnivorous habits to supply, to supplement its dietary needs. This is fun and interesting because it's usually the animals that eat the plants but not in the case of the pitcher plant and a few other New Jersey natives I'll introduce later. The pitcher plant has a basal rosette of leaves that do the dirty work of capturing insects as their main source of nitrogen. The leaves are tubular or pitcher shaped. This colorful patterned area is called the flared flap containing nectar glands, brightly colored veins, and fragrance to attract insect prey. Each flap has two lateral rounded lobes. The inside of the flap is covered with downward pointing hairs, which are modified stomata, directing insects into the pitcher and discouraging their exit. The collar like upper rim is called the peristome. New research shows the rim reflects ultraviolet light that some insects can see. You can see that this pitcher is holding rainwater. As the insects descend into the leaf, they slip and fall into the water. Enzymes secreted by the plant break down the insects and the plant absorbs the nutrients, in particular the nitrogen. Now pitcher plants don't need to eat insects in order to survive, as they do also photosynthesize. But the scientific literature says that plants that supplement their diet with insects are healthier. A single flower emerges from the center of the basal leaves on a tall slender scape in late May. And here's a tightly closed bud. I took this photo about two weeks ago. As the bud begins to open, you can see the five petals, which are a magnificent dark red color. They protect the reproductive parts of the flower during the bud stage, but fall off shortly after the bud opens. The central part of the flower is a green disc called the umbrella which is actually the style. Under the style are several stamen you can see in this photo. The pitcher plant is pollinated by native bumblebees and the pitcher plant fly. Here are the five red sepals of the flower giving a contrasting backdrop to the green umbrella. Personally, I never tire of looking at this unique flower. It, its beauty radiates from every angle and in every season, even in the winter. Here are last year's flowers. Can you see a Halloween cat in the flower to the right? This flower spent the winter wrapped around another flower called gold crest, a crown and a scepter. I can see what appear to be tiny seeds held by the dried umbrella like a basket. Sharing the bog with the pitcher plant is the pipewort. Pipeworts 
are tight round clusters of tiny flowers at the tip of a naked stalk. Pipeworts are wetland herbs that can grow entirely in the water, like this group found in Warren Grove, or entirely out of the water, but close to its edge. There are three species of pipeworts in the Pine Barrens, all growing in wet, marshy habitats. Flattened pipewort blooms in mid-May to late June. The other two species bloom in mid-July to early October. The fun of taking pictures of these plants is looking at them later and seeing things that my eye missed at the site, such as the beautiful spider web knitting these plants together. June is my favorite month to visit bogs and wetlands. Lots of unique and beautiful plants are in bloom. Grass pink, Calipogon tuberosus, is the second of three bog orchids I look for in my botanical travels into the wetlands of the pines each year. It blooms in early or mid-June to late July. A flowering scape grows from an underground bulb. And on the scape, you can find a handful of individual flowers that bloom sequentially up the stem, starting at the bottom. The flower is made of both petals and sepals of the same pink color. The uppermost petal is bearded with fleshy hair-like structures. An attractant for insects, such as this cute bee. The difference between this orchid and the other orchid Arethusa bulbosa or dragon's mouth, is that the beard on the grass pink is the uppermost petal and dragon's mouth has a bearded lip on the bottom. Grass pink also has several flowers on its scape, whereas dragon dragon's mouth only has one. Rose pagonia, sometimes you can catch this beautiful uh, blooming orchid at the same time and in the same place as grass pink. And this is the third of our three bog orchids. Like dragon's mouth, rose pagonia has a bearded bottom lip and is sometimes called snake mouth. This bottom lip is used as a landing platform for insects although the flower is smaller than the other two orchid flowers, measuring only about an inch or two across. Like dragon's mouth, rose begonia has a single flower on each scape. And here it is blooming with other wildflowers in the bog. A perennial herb, rose begonia propagates through runners as well as seed. At the end of the season, the fruit capsule dries up breaks open, and inside are hundreds of tiny seeds that will fall into the water and await their turn in the bog. Bladderwort, Utricularia, with its beautiful yellow flowers, blooms alongside rose pagonia in mid to late June into early August. Bladderworts are carnivorous herbs like the pitcher plant. However, they grow without roots. At the base of their stalk, you can see a radial structure of modified leaves, each divided into smaller hair-like segments containing air sacs or bladders that provide the plant with buoyancy. Each tiny bladder has a tiny bristle at the opening of the bladder, barely visible in this photo. When the bristle is triggered by a microscopic organism, the trap springs and with lightning speed, water is drawn into the bladder like a vacuum along with the organism. Enzymes and bacteria then decay the animal and the nutrients are absorbed by the plant. Horned bladderwort, Utricularia cornuta, has a small, beautifully shaped flower easily identified by a protruding horn or spur. It blooms mid or late June to early August. And I have yet to identify the other bladderwort pictured here, although it is one of 14 bladderwort species in New Jersey 
10 of which can be found in the pine lands. And I can also eliminate two species that have purple flowers and one rare species that has a white flower and all the rest have yellow flowers. This photo on the right was taken at Webb's Mill Bog on June 10th, 2017. And here's a lovely grouping of horned bladder warts in Webb's Mill Bog on Route 539, not very far from the dry sandy pine plains. The next plant I'm going to introduce to you is called Gold Crest. And this was the crown pictured with the scepter in a previous photo. And this is another favorite wildflower of the bog. It is a perennial herb with a tall stem topped by a cluster of flowers. Before they bloom, the flower buds are held tightly in a, in a ball covered with woolly hairs. Botanists call that tomentose. The buds unfurl into a stiff multi-branched white structure. And one by one, the tiny bright yellow flowers bloom. They look like beautiful little shining stars. The anthers at the tip of the stamen are a blazing orange. A characteristic species found only within the heart of the Pine Barrens, Goldcrest is sharing the bog with horned bladderwort and pitcher plants. Even after the stars dim, this plant plays an important ecological role, offering structure for other organisms to build homes. Its tiny seeds are shed. And as the seasons change, Goldcrest maintains its beauty in the quiet bog. Bog asphodel is in the lily family. It is a one and a half to two foot stalk. And the stalk terminates in a dense cluster of small yellow flowers that bloom mid-June to late July. It is a threatened plant in New Jersey, although Webb's Mill Bog has a nice population of individuals that grow a short distance away from the boardwalk that encircles the bog. Although on occasion, one or two plants make their way to center stage where they mix with the rose begonia, gold crest, and bladder wart. Although this plant showcases its flowers in the summer, it offers an encore in early fall when the fruit dries into an autumn orange. A visit to the bog in September will reward you with sunset views of bog asphodel. And I'd be remiss if I didn't include American cranberry in the lineup of must see plants with its crane shaped flowers blooming mid June to mid July. After all, it is the progenitor of our commercially grown cranberries. The berry contains air sacs to keep it buoyant in the bog. Not known to be a favorite of wildlife, its seeds are dispersed by water. It adds color to a bog's winter landscape. Other June blooming wetland favorite shrubs include highbush blueberry, Inkberry holly, whose small yet beautiful white flowers that attract numerous pollinators, turn into beautiful black berries that feed the birds. And swamp azalea, whose delicate flowers also provide nourishment to beneficial insects. June is also the time to return to the dry sandy barrens to see goat's rue in bloom. This tenacious perennial grows from a combination taproot and stout fibrous root into a one to two foot multi-branched flowering herb. Leaves are pinnately compound, meaning they are divided into many smaller leaflets resembling ferns. Flowers are in clusters at the tips of the branches. Each flower has a conspicuous yellow upper petal as well as a pink or purple lower petal. It can be purchased by native nurse, through native nurseries and is a nice addition to a sandy soiled yard or garden. 
And because it's a legume, it fixes nitrogen in the soil. July is the month for sundews, another type of carnivorous plant. I'm going to introduce you to New Jersey's three native species of sundews, all of which you can find while exploring the bogs of the Pinelands and all named for the shape of their leaves. The least common of the three is round-leaved sundew. Drosera rotundifolia. Each of these paddles are its leaves. The tip of each leaf is rounded, distinguishing it from spatulate leaved sundew that has a more spatula shape or a better description would be a spoon shaped leaf tip. The round leaved sundews grow more prostrate, low to the ground and flat. The spatulate leaved sundews have an upright appearance with their leaves extending from a center stalk growing longer than they are wide, accentuating the narrow tip. Here is a colony of both round leaved sundews and spatulate leaved sundews growing on a stump in Oyster Creek in Waretown that I found while canoeing Wells Mills Lake. I found this mix of species interesting because round leaved sundews tend to prefer, sh prefer shade and spatulate leaved sundews prefer open sun. Each leaf of both species is covered with hair-like structures or tentacles tipped with reddish glands that secrete a fragrant sticky substance called mucilage, luring and trapping visiting insects. Tentacles bend over the victim, pushing it towards the paddle of the leaf where there are more digestive glands. Enzymes exuded from the plant mix with a weak acid found in the sticky mucilage and digest to the trapped insect in about 24 to 48 hours. And the plant absorbs the nutrients. Flowers of both species are white Pictured here are the flowers of round leaved sundew. And depending on many factors, including the time of year, amount of precipitation, and beaver activity upstream, bogs may be very dry or very wet. Here you can see that the bog has dried up. Thread leaved sundew, Drosera filiformis, is showcasing its tenacity and hardiness traits required of all plants that live in barrens and bogs. thread leaf sundew has very long thread-like leaves that grow from the base of the plant, a basal stem, and unfurl as they grow, much like a fern's fiddlehead. thread leaf sundew also has mucilaginous glands dotting the tips of tentacles covering each leaf. This plant in the photo also has two flowering or two flowers unfurling in the center. The flower stem called a peduncle lacks the tentacles and glands. The delicate buds are protected in the center of the furl. Thread leaf is the earliest blooming of the three sundews. Plants can begin blooming at the end of June into July and even late August. The flower has five petals in a lovely shade of pink, contrasting with bright yellow anthers. Flower buds line each flower stalk, one on top of the other. The lowest bud opens first. It opens in the morning and only remains open until about noontime. It blooms only one or two days. Then the next bud up the stalk blooms for half a day for one or two days, and then it's the turn of the one above, and so on, each bud taking its turn one at a time. Once the last flower blooms, the stalk is completely unfurled. And here's a fly visiting the Drosera flower. It makes me wonder, how do carnivorous plants resolve the pollinator prey conflict? How do they spare the insects that pollinate their flowers 
while trapping their prey. Whether in bloom or after bloom, sundews are a magnificent sight. And a special thanks to Hubert and Millie Ling from the Native Plant Society of New Jersey for providing me with the flowers, with the photos of the flowers of Drosera. Here is another magnificent site. It has earned its name, Meadow Beauty. It lives in bogs and grows from one to two foot tall. Each of the four pinkish purple flower petals have a slightly lopsided shape. The filaments are yellow and the pollen bearing anthers are bright yellow, curved and attached to the filament at right angles. Here the white pistil consisting of the style and the stigma is stretched out beyond the stamen. After fertilization, the petals fall off and the stamen curl up and turn orange. The identity of the flower is hardly recognizable. To an untrained eye, the vase shaped fruit looks like a different flower. And I recall years ago when I was a novice, as I still am, I could not find this vase shaped flower in my field guide. It wasn't until I found flowers nearby in various stages of bloom and fruit that I realized what I was looking at, meadow beauty. It is a beauty in all stages of its life cycle. August brings us to the end of the summer. I'll share three more favorite plants. Asters. It's true we have asters in our gardens at home, but whenever I see a garden flower blooming out in the wild, being wild, blooming for its own sake, not for me, I feel a deeper level of appreciation for its beauty and its ability to survive and thrive, untethered to my human desire for controlling nature. The slender, delicate, blush blue petals of bog aster are quite special. They bloom mid-August to late September. These flowers were enjoyed at White's Bog Village, growing on the edges of the cranberry bogs. Everything about Marsh St. John's wort is stunning. The buds are a brilliant peachy orange color. The tops of the leaves are a soft green with a purple tinge and an even softer green underneath with a silvery tinge. The stem and the veins of the leaves are pink. As the buds mature, they turn different shades of orange, pink, and purple. Two leaves grow opposite one another and are attached directly to the stem with no petiole. Botanists call these sessile leaves. Each pair of leaves faces in a north-south or east-west direction, opposite the pair directly below. The flowers in bloom are a sight to behold, as I'm sure you are witnessing right now. They bloom in shades of purple and pink and peachy orange. And although I'm intrigued by the carnivorous habits of sundews and bladderworts and provoked by the deceptive beauty of pink lady slipper, I am absolutely enamored by the sheer elegance of this perfect flower. But I have one last plant to share with you today. It's a plant that lures botanists to the pinelands from all over the world called curly grass fern, Skyzea pusilla. It is not a flowering plant. Instead, it is a fern which reproduces by spores. According to Whitmer Stone, an American botanist living in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, this plant was first discovered in the early 1800s at Quaker Bridge in the Pine Barrens. It attracted much interest worldwide then and continues to draw worldwide interest now. 
in New Jersey, it is considered a rare plant. It is endangered in New York and Delaware. The low growing curly blades are vegetative infertile fronds. They are very, very tiny and very unfern like. They look like tiny evergreen blades of curly grass. The taller upright blades are the fertile fronds, which give way to one sided segmented fruiting bodies in July and August. The fruiting bodies hold the spores. If the spore finds suitable conditions, it will grow into a tiny heart-shaped plantlet called a gametophyte. The gametophyte is the intermediate stage from spore to adult fern. It contains the genetic material of the adult fern in the form of both sperm cells and egg cells. If there is a proper amount of moisture in the immediate habitat, the sperm cells swim towards the egg cells, either on the same gametophyte or an adjacent one. They fuse their genetic material to make a cell with the full adult fern set of genes. This cell is the beginning of the adult fern. Ferns are a very ancient group of plants, older than land animals and far older than dinosaurs. They were thriving on earth for 200 million years before the flowering plants evolved. There are so many more unique plants and wildflowers of the barrens and bogs that I just don't have enough time to show you today, but hopefully you are now inspired to take a walk in your local woodlands, visit nearby wetlands, or take a trip to the Pine Barrens in South Jersey and go exploring. Join a guided walk, take a botanical field class offered by one of our many wonderful local conservation organizations, or just go outside and enjoy the beauty of our natural world. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, if anyone out there has questions, please feel free to call the number on the screen uh, and Becky will be glad to answer any questions you might have uh, or thought of during her presentation. Uh, thank you all for attending and look forward to answering some questions.
Okay, Becky, it looks like we haven't had any questions come in. We'll hold for another moment or two to see if any come and okay, we'll uh, go from there. All right, I'm here. I hope everybody enjoyed the program and I hope everyone is inspired to go out and take a walk in the pine lands. Okay, we got a question. Let me uh, bring them in. Okay. Hello, you are live and uh, we'd like to hear your question. Good morning. Hey, Becky. Okay. Yes. Uh, Becky, hi. Uh, this is uh, Scott from Cherry Hill. I'm not. Um... Hello, you are live and uh, we'd like to hear your question. Great. Uh, so I'm Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just want I, I think there might be some additional feedback there, but I am hearing you loud and clear. Um, did you say your name was Don? Yes. Don, hi. Well, what is your Hi. question this morning? Good morning. Uh, could, could you give, uh, could you give? Additional feedback there, but I am hearing you loud and clear. Um, did you say your name is Don? It, my name is Scott. Don, Scott. What is your you know what, Scott? I think it might be, you might have both your computer on and your uh, phone. So that, that delay, I'm hearing myself speak twice and you speak twice. Okay, I turned off my uh, computer. Perfect, thank you. Good. So um, um, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not very familiar with the Pine Barrens. I mean, I live in Cherry Hill and I've driven through it and, uh, you know, over the years, but uh, so uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, my question though is, um, uh, do you have, can you give some pointers on locations uh, for these wonderful plants um, that you've described where we would be maybe likely to find them? Yes, thank you, Scott. That's a great question. Um, I tend to go to my, uh, I'll call them my usual spots that I'm happy to share with you. And um, Joel is also, of course, on this call and he has some of his own favorite spots that he goes to. Um, for many of the plants that I, I shared photos with in this presentation, I visit a place called Warren Grove and there's a, a it's called a bombing range, but there is public access. <laughs> it's, it's off route 539 in Warren Grove. And it's a, it's a dirt road and they just uh, re-graveled it. So it's easy to drive on. Um, there's really nothing at the entrance. Um, uh, you have to take 539 uh, head, head south on 539 and Joel can jump in and, and share maybe more particulars. But that place offers um, a pygmy pine forest, which is very unique in um, New Jersey, in the world. And as well as the pygmy pine forest, many of the, the dry uh, sand loving plants grow there, um, such as the bearberry. Um, and there's also a pond in that area. So the water table is a little bit higher in some areas than other areas in that same location. And that's where you can find um, pixie and sand myrtle. And I've seen tur turkey beard blooming out there and an array of, of different plants. Another location that's actually um, on the same road, not too far away, a couple miles away is called Webb's Mill Bog. And if you Google that, that's actually um, under the jurisdiction, I believe, or the management of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And they have so kindly uh, built a boardwalk, a circular boardwalk that goes right over the bog. So you can walk on the boardwalk and see all those different uh, beautiful bog plants, such as the pitcher plant and the bladderwort and all three orchids grow there, the rose pagonia and um, dragon's mouth and grass pink. Um, those are my two main go-to locations. Uh, in addition, I like to visit Double Trouble State Park in Ocean County and Double Trouble State Park offers um, hardwood swamps and Atlantic white cedar swamps. Um, that is where um, I see uh, Gold Club blooming early um, in the year and um, swamp azalea and an array of, of different plants. Um, some I haven't pictured here, such as um, slender um, blue flag, which is an iris, a native iris, 
um, the uh, carnivorous sundews uh, can be found uh, really at, at any one of these places. In addition, I like to go to Wells Mills County Park in Waretown, and I can find um, sundews growing there. Uh, many of the photos I shared with you today were taken at Wells Mills County Park. You can actually rent a canoe for, I believe it's $3 per person per half hour. It's the best deal in town at Wells Mills County Park. And canoe on the very um, secluded and protected lake and all around the edges of the lake, you can actually lean in and see the different sundews and lots of different um, wetland plants there. So there's a handful of plants for you to, to start your adventures or a handful of locations Great. for you to start Great. your adventures. Uh, just, just one more. Uh, when you mentioned Web Middle Blog, is that also off of 539? Yeah, so so the names are similar, but um, so there's a place called Webs, W-E-B-B, -B, Webs Mill right. Bog, and that's on 539. And then there's Wells, W-E-L-L, -L, Wells Mills County Park, and that's in Waretown. They're actually not far from each other. Okay. Uh, just to help, and, uh, Webs Mill is exactly 6.2 miles north of the intersection of Route 539 and Route 72. Um, and if you travel north on 539, you'll see a, a sign on the left-hand side of the road, which is for Greenwood uh, Wildlife Management Area. And on the right-hand side of the road is the little trail, which will take you back to that boardwalk and uh, where you can see uh, many of the plants that Becky described uh, so nicely for us today. Okay, did you, say green, did you say Green's Wood? Uh, yeah, it's uh, part of Greenwood Wildlife Management Area. Okay, and the bombing range, uh, Warren Grove. Yep. Is that marked? Is that marked with any kind of a sign? Uh, it is a mark? sign. There is a sign there. The signs for Range Road, and um, range, range Road. Yep. Okay. And it's between the little village of Warren Grove and the Garden State Parkway. So if you're going west or, excuse me, north on Route 539, as you pass the parkway, within a two miles or so, you're gonna run into this, the area of the Pine Plains. And uh, that's where you'll see Range Road, which uh, does go to a uh, bombing range, um, but it's one of the most diverse and uh, better uh, Pine Barrens habitat examples that we have in the world. Great. Well, thank you both so much, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll see you out there at one of these locations. Oh, that would be wonderful, Scott. Uh, I'll be able to recognize you now. Yes. <laughs> Enjoy okay, thank your exploring. Okay, thanks very much. Have a great day. You too. Any more questions? That was a great question. It's important that people know where to go and see these beautiful plants. Yep, uh, and again, this is really a prime time, particularly for some of those upland plants, uh, things like the turkey beard, uh, the mountain laurel is about to pop, the street laurel. So this is actually a great time to uh, get out and see uh, what's going on in the pinelands. Right. Hopefully people will, will make it a, a monthly adventure and yep have an opportunity to see an array of different wild wildflowers. And if folks have any more questions, my, my email is listed on the slide, education at soildistrict.org. And I'm sure also Joel would be happy to to share his email. He is a wealth of knowledge. You are, Joel. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you for your presentation. It was a very nice presentation, very organized, uh, very clear with some great facts and some great pictures and a really good uh, way to get in touch with the plants uh, that inhabit the bogs and the barrens. So thank you very much for the presentation, Becky. You're so um, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Yep, anytime. Uh, again, as Becky said, this is our summer speaker series. It's going to be a series of webinars. They're going to be on uh, Thursdays at 10 o'clock. And uh, next week we have uh, David Robinson, the state climatologist, is going to talk about 
some of the variability of the climate and how that may affect the pinelands uh, going forward. Great, and I will see you back on July 23rd with my colleague, Karen Walzer, and we'll be talking about uh, combating climate change with a Jersey friendly yard. All right, that's gonna wrap things up. I'm going to uh, shut down the live stream. Again, uh, thank you very much, Becky, great job. You're welcome, thank you. Have a great day, everybody.